This is Mead McLean with AUSquared.com, back with uh, an interview with Man Bartlett. This is the long version. It runs for about two hours. If you want to watch a, a cut version, there's a 40-minute one as well. Um, you'll find that uh, Man Bartlett's work uh, has a lot to do with uh, social networking uh, and technology. He's a big fan of Twitter. Um, and uh, you'll also notice that he is um, very critically minded uh, especially towards uh, socioeconomic issues. Um, and I think you'll find him uh, uh, articulate and and uh, extremely interesting. You'll hear a lot about um, what it's like to be an artist in New York and uh, a little bit about how to rise above the noise in a uh, crowded art world. Enjoy. Okay. Now, hey, now we're talking. There you go. Nice. Awesome. So yeah. Yeah, it uh um I guess uh I mean I guess we should start with uh the AU squared, sort of like why I'm even doing this whole thing. Great. Um, just to get you kind of familiar with that, like I um I came up with the idea about like uh almost a year ago of doing like some type of online art school as as like a, sort of a digital textbook or um or some way of just compiling a lot of information from different artists um and allowing a bunch of people to contribute to it and uh have it be a little more oriented towards you know not success in art school but for success like making art and and living that sort of life yeah yeah, yeah. And because I always felt like schools were divided to like 90 percent technical things right. and like, you know, maybe a couple of percent professional type stuff. So yeah. I wanted to like shift that relationship to where it was like a third on improving your brain and a third on like things that you could use to make art and a third on on like artist interviews and dealers and stuff like that. So cool. that's kind of where it's at right now. And so uh, I'm just collecting a bunch of. A bunch of data and recording lessons and uh before awesome. I, yeah so before i really get to like the interactive stuff with the with the site i'm just collecting a bunch of content so yeah probably and wait, do you have like a, a launch timeline or like a i'm thinking roughly a couple more years wow just to build like a serious amount of information before yeah. um before launching because I, yeah. I don't want to launch with like maybe some some lessons on perspective drawing, you know. I want sure. it wants to be pretty fleshed out by the time. <laughs> yeah, you some lessons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Entire university, one lesson on perspective drawing. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, but um, you know, I figured I'd start somewhere with uh, with people that I know, like through friends and stuff, because uh, you know, um, you know Nick Rad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was one of my friends from from art school. We uh, we drew a lot together for for a year or so. Okay. There. So I've kept up with him a little bit, and uh, and I guess uh, the first time I heard of of you and your work was around like the hashtag class thing at the Winkleman Gallery a few yeah, yeah. years ago. Um, Pretty early on, yeah. Yeah, and I've been uh, sort of following what you've been doing since then. Um, and actually, like the art school thing may have even the seeds of that may have even started during that hashtag class time, you know, yeah, Trying to totally. come up with like so I remember the the theme, like I think Ed was talking one time about creating new sort of institutions to replace the old ones, yeah, and uh that's, and that's kinda, desperately needed, I mean, on so yeah. many levels. Yeah, and I saw that like Bruce High Quality was doing some doing some things in person, but you know I wanted to sort of democratize it and and curate. So yeah, that's yeah and I'm that's doing. really yeah, and the Bruce stuff is interesting, but it also ends up sort of like you're saying, it ends up not being that much of a democracy, and that you have to be there. But then also, it's still very much the Bruce High Quality. Yeah, it's an interesting you know way yeah. that they're going about doing it. You know. But. Yeah. Have you been over to any of their uh, lectures or anything? Yeah, I went to one. Uh, man, I guess it's been a couple of years now. But I, um, uh, someone that I had met through 
the internet, I guess, was was like assisting a, a class over there that I went to, and it was kind of bizarre, and it was, yeah, I don't know, it was it was weird, but um, yeah. you know, it was cool. I was like, all right, a free class, you know, about yeah. talking about art, but it. it I think I ended up kind of leaving there feeling like I don't know. It was it just the vibe wasn't really for me. Like you know, sometimes you walk into a room and you're like, oh, I belong in this room. Other times, yeah. like, what? Oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. And that was a little bit like that. It was kind of like y'all seem like interesting, but you also seem like a little bit too cool for school. And like, you yeah. know. Anyway, and sometimes that's okay, and other times it's like. Not yeah, like a I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was cool when they did did the Bruce Ennio and like. Oh yeah. It was 2010. Like yeah. that was that was such a cool way to go about it. And I yeah. I stumbled on that accidentally, and I and I had heard about it and uh, didn't know where it was, and then I was all of a sudden in it, and uh, and it was amazing. It was probably my favorite show at at the time. Yeah. That I'd yeah. Seen. And I'd gone at that point. I had gone like to everything. You know, oh, been to uh, all the museums, all the major museums. Like. Yeah. It, a whole day of Chelsea galleries and, yeah. and stuff. And that was really like, so, it's really so exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, you know, it's funny cause I, uh, I remember I participated in the 2010 by uh, Bruce Ennial and then in 2012, I like didn't, I kind of was like, I don't know, for whatever reason I didn't, I think I was out of the town or something. I just wasn't, you know, keeping as much up to date on it. But then when I went and saw it in person, I was like shocked at how good it was. I mean, from, the highest highbrow, there was like a Damien Hurst in it to like the lowest lowbrow, but like it all worked together. It was just really kind of amazing to see that like such a clusterfuck come together so well. And even like to, to my eyes better than 2010 or just like, I don't know, it's, it's hard to tell if it's your experience or just like the day that you happen to walk in there or what, yeah. but yeah. So yeah, it's really, that's pretty interesting. And, uh, um, I guess uh, I want to talk like specifically about some of the some of the work that was on your uh, on your website and stuff. Um, I just finished reading uh, the image by Daniel Boyston, um, which is uh, sort of about about pseudo culture in general and pseudo society and uh, and it was written in the I think in the late '60s. Okay, so it was yeah. kind of uh, or maybe 1961 even. Um, so it was kind of. Uh, prophetic in terms of um in terms of like pinning down american culture and uh and i thought i thought your collages kind of had a lot to do with that um that whole idea a because they're sort of from that era you know the sort of like 1950s uh you know housewife yeah imagery and, and the yeah, yeah. suitcases and, and old technology. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it was, it's interesting to, for me to think about like the uh, idea of, of like Panopticon, like coming out at about that time and being written about, and now it's just become like completely mundane, you know, cell phone yeah. cameras, you know, and we, yeah. and we do it voluntarily. And I thought that that is like pretty much like, like right at the core of of a lot of those uh, a lot of those collages. Yeah, I you know I it's funny about that whole body of work because I happen to be in a place called Materials for the Arts, which is this great um, I guess it's an organization in Long Island City in, in New York. And um, if you're part of an organization or you're connected to an organization, you can um, basically shop for free. And so people donate materials. They donate <laughs> materials for the arts um, to this to this place. And so I found a stack of these magazines or 10 of them, all the same magazine. And mm -hmm. it was from that era. Yeah. And I didn't know what I was going to do with them for like, man, for months, they just sat in my studio. And, and that particular time period, you know, I associate with, you know, a, almost an older generation's interpretation of that generation. So yeah. I feel like it was my grandfather's generation and, you know, my grandmother's and my, you know, my parents then had the interpretation of that time period that they, you know, do and did. And then I'm having this almost like twice removed experience yeah. of it. And sort of through that lens is how I've kind of been thinking about them. And like even recently I started calling them like faux retro. It's like they're not really yeah. retro. It's like removed from that. But thinking about particularly not just the technology but 
like coming out of the war and um, what was going on in, in the American psyche and what, what, like, what was going through people's heads. I mean, you know, and, and how that led to sort of travel and thinking about um, literally how much travel was happening during that period. And that, you know, which is why there were so yeah. many suitcases being developed. And then like how that all links into kind of the industrial complex and yeah. like the manufacturing in this of country course. and how that like very brief window of time was so like um, – Productive, you know, like yeah. so much stuff was made. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. Yeah. That was kind and of so, like, that yeah, was kind yeah. of the high point of that, and and that was like the first time that that travel had like fully gone middle class. And then yeah. there was the infrastructure too. It's you know they weren't developing new backpacks, you know. Yeah, they're developing yeah, yeah. suitcases meant to be carried, you know, short distances or carried yeah. by someone else entirely. Yeah, you know, yeah, that. yeah. And that was like really when, you know flight caught on and travel agencies had already been established for a while. Yeah. You know, cruises, things like that were really taken off. And there was a healthy middle class. I mean, that's something yeah. that, I'm, that I've been thinking a lot about over the past couple of years. And, um, you know, I remember actually being, you know, I was born in 1981, so I'm a little baby. But, you know, I remember my dad telling me during the Clinton, I can't remember what part of Clinton's uh, presidency or terms, but I remember him literally saying, you know, things have never been this good and they'll never be this good again. You know, like yeah. things are beyond good right now. You don't even know. And, um, and not really realizing what that meant until 2008. And, and, you know, and starting to kind of piece together the last, I don't know, a couple hundred years of American history and understanding that on a personal level, what that means for my generation. But then in relationship to other periods of American history, and particularly that time period where, you know, we were making things and we were, you know, there's all this kind of optimism and, yeah. And then trying to relate that back to now and, you know, and, and what that means. And, oh, and, and this idea of the middle class and the shrinking. I saw this graph the other day, which, like, showed what we, what Americans, 5,000 Americans thought, you know, the distribution of wealth is in this country um, versus what it actually is. Yeah. And, and just, it's like, makes you want to cry. Um, so I think that particular time period is something that I'm looking back to, to, like, try and understand, um, you know, what what that means for me and what that means for sort of my generation and um yeah and trying to get any sort of sense of where things can go from here you know yeah so because i mean yeah particularly since 2008 for so many people that i know and myself included it's it's uh yeah work yeah. is hard to find <laughs> yeah. it's very true you know and uh yeah. and i mean i finished grad school in 2010 um and that was about sort of well i avoided like two years of recession through grad yeah. school but in terms of like student loan rates like that was that was a huge a huge deal and yeah and coming to grips with that and basically you know living on on like 50 bucks a month after like paying student loans off yeah you know it's a real a big wake-up call and yeah I mean, that was kind of like the first time that like, you know, personal finance really like hit home. Yeah. You know, because like right I, after, oh, you sorry. know, right after my undergrad, it was like I had a job and I felt rich on making like nine or 10 bucks an hour, you know, yeah. and yeah. like, you know, after, after the grad school thing with the student loans and it was, it was pretty rough and a very yeah. different sort of situation. Yeah. And I have no, I'm not, I have no disillusions about prior time periods and, you know, I don't, yeah. I'm not like claiming that that sort of capitalism is better by any means, but oh, yeah, for sure. not having a healthy middle class in a capitalist society is an increasingly like major, major problem. Yeah. And so, yeah. And it's, you know, it's frustrating. Uh, you know, I've been thinking recently, you know, and, and you know, when, when that economic stuff really hit, I, uh, I left the country and I went traveling for a little while and, and I was so lucky in that the job that I was laid off from, like I got a severance from, I was able to sublet my apartment and, you know, collect unemployment and travel during that time. And I still have guilt about doing that. Like yeah. it's not, you know, but, you know, my superiors, people that were, you know, that had hired me were looking for jobs at my level at like, you know, with 25% pay cuts and what I was making. Yeah. So I was sort of looking at that, like, there is no, like, you know, this doesn't look that good. And, um, so, I mean, that's the excuse that I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go and see the world. And, like, you know, there's probably no other time I'm going to be able to do this. Yeah. And, um, but when I got back to New York, there were still no jobs. And, 
you know, I literally just decided that like if I wasn't going to be able to find a job at that time, then I, I would just start selling art and yeah. just give it a shot, you know. And um, and you know, flash forward a couple of years, I guess it's a little over three now, um, coming up on like three and a half years, and like somehow I, you know, from the the outside, I've made it, um, you know. But financially, it's it's like still. You know, it's so, it's, you know, it's beyond stressful because you just have no, I mean, uh, luckily I don't have that much debt. I mean, I'm incredibly lucky that yeah. you know, I have $800 worth of debt and that's like, you know, but, you know, when, when you've got a couple dollars to your name and you don't know when anything is coming in, it's, um, it adds a layer of complexity to sort of the work that you're doing and how you're getting it out there and how you're surviving off of it. Right. So, so for the first time in a really long time, I'm actually looking at like, you know, trying to use some of the experiences that I've had over these three years of sort of marketing myself into some other capacity, you know. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's really, um, again, and I don't, I don't think my situation is any special. I mean, on uh, on the outside, I'm, I've been extremely fortunate and extremely lucky to have the the experiences that I've had and to be able yeah. to create the work that I've had. But you know, I think. It's just interesting. I think back about what people have told me, like along the way, like advice that people have given me. You know, that's like concrete advice. And honestly, some of the the best advice I got was from Dan Cameron, a curator based out of New Orleans, who I think it was even in like a Facebook post from years ago. But he just said, like, get your rent squared away as soon as possible and make it as cheap as possible. You know, and yeah. so like, just get all your expenses, make them as low as po- as humanly possible, and. Yeah. And that's like, quite frankly, the only reason I've been able to do what I've been able to do is because of that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it no, ends up like. I mean, that's that's a cool thing to hear because, like, you know, I think most people, maybe around high school or early college, first their their minds sort of convert from looking at Michelangelo and Renaissance artists uh, to like maybe Art Twenty One. Yeah, you know, that's like their first exposure of like of like the art world and what yeah. modern artists are like. Yeah, and then they see like that they're hooked up, you know, set up yeah. for set up for life, great studios. Over, you know? They've got like shows in all these huge places, and yeah. you kind of assume that that's the way it's going to be. And then yeah. you get in deeper, and you see people that are showing all the time, and then you realize that they've maybe got the exposure but maybe not like the finances that yeah. you know that the really huge huge artists have yeah and uh i mean that's one of those like harsh reality things you yeah know. and and i mean I, I always went in with the attitude of like you know that these aren't sacrifices they're choices you know like mm-hmm. i choose to do this i've choose to live this way like you know and and granted it's a tough job market but like you know these are choices that I'm making and I feel like that's an important position to work from so that it's not like I'm a victim to anything, you know? Um, and it was actually, you know, speaking of like our perception of like artists that are making it or what they're doing. I remember another, um, artist and someone who works at a gallery that I know in, in town was talking about how when he was in school, excuse me, um, there was like a pretty well-known artist that came and, uh, and gave, you know, crits or a guest lectured at the school. And I remember the person telling me that like, it was like, Oh my God, this artist came and it was like such a big deal. Mm -hmm. And that when that person graduated, he was like that, that big deal artist was actually like also an art handler and like working, you know, like barely surviving, you know? And so that, you know, being in school and having someone come and like speak with you, you have this perception of, of what their power is or what their, you know, level of importance. And then you might get out into the world and you realize, wow, like they have some, you know, really low paying day job, you know, or like something, you know, yeah, you know yeah. it is. And, and I think part of my frustration, but also where I've like sought out opportunities to dispel some of those uh, myths or, or, you know, is being very transparent about, um, you know, what it's like. Um, and not to claim that I have any, um, anything over anyone or under anything or whatever, but just to be very clear of like, you know, there are plenty of people. um, I remember seeing one time that you were, uh, that you were negotiating, uh, the price of a circle drawing, like over Twitter. 
Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, that's a cool thing to see because, you know, usually that's that's like very much a, a closed door thing, you know. Very private. Yeah. yeah. People don't talk about that stuff. And and that's why I wanted to do it. And, you know, and and that, you know, came out of a series of events that, you know, willing parties and people that were, you know, willing to sort of do that. And, and you know, part of the issue with, you know, I can be willing to be, hey, I'm going to have everything out in the open, but the reality is that m- most collectors aren't, you know, that yeah. willing and they're not that game to have that sort of exposure. Um, and I think it's a generational thing, but it's also just people don't trust it and um, yeah. so that can complicate it. But, you know, so it's really exciting when that, when that sort of thing can happen. And sure enough, yeah, it was like totally done transparently and um i'm actually still working on that drawing <laughs> it's yeah. like it's such a huge commission <laughs> yeah so yeah, yeah. and, and, like and I, you know i did that project endeavor. where sorry what's that it looked like it was gonna be a huge endeavor yeah a giant it, piece of paper it's, tiny circles <laughs> yeah it's like and i love it i mean i've been doing those drawings since 2006 and so i really they're to me they're an important part of my practice and they don't you know, they're quiet and most people don't care about them, which is great because they don't, you know, they're not in any yeah. space that, that most people are looking at. But to yeah. me, they round out a practice that's important for me that I maintain these kind of different worlds that I operate in. And one of them is just standing in front of a drawing for however many hours and, yeah. and just working on it, you know. And then the other one is like the frenetic, like in front of the computer yeah. and, and that sort of, and they balance each other out, you know. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that, you know, those circle drawings in terms of like time and technology and, and that's kind of a, that's kind of a big thing to, for most artists, I think is to get away from like technological sorts of time yeah. you know, to be able to spend time just like, you know, either doing something repetitive or just thinking and sitting or, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. The dishes are really great for that. I love doing the dishes. Yeah. Yeah, because it's it's that same sort of action. It sounds ridiculous, but you know, I um, I don't know. There's something about, and I think it's because of the complexity of all the information that we have access to, and the way that I process uh, it, it, things that I'm seeing or thinking about is sometimes incredibly overwhelming. Like, yeah, and I don't. I mean, probably a lot of people have that happening, but I don't. I can't always filter what's coming in, and so it's yeah. like. Information, information, information. And so when I'm online, yeah. it's like everything, everything, everything. And it's like going in and like flying around in there. And I'm like, <laughs> it's sort of having fun with it, but it's also freaking me out. Yeah. You know? And um, and sometimes that's cool. I can run with it. And other times I'm like, ha, ah, ha, get me out of here. And so the yeah. circles help. But then also just literally like doing one thing, you know, like the dishes is so like – disproportionately relaxing <laughs> yeah. because it's just like my, I'm sort of moving, but I'm also like, you know, yeah. so, and it works out great because my fiance is a great cook. So like she cooks and I do the dishes and it's like, yeah. it's perfect, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is but, but at the yeah, same I understand time. What like, you mean. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Cause like, I just, um, I just started taking uh Kung Fu classes like yeah. in October okay. and it yeah. trained your awareness to sort of like spread outwards. Yeah. Yeah. And be, yeah totally sort of consumed in in your world and yeah. and then you go out, you know i go out into like public places coffee shops and i and it's very tough to not hear every conversation all at once yeah yeah and uh and that's sort of like i, I don't think it's an awareness that most people ever really you know necessarily get a glimpse of yeah nine out of ten people aren't uh, just aren't aware i mean which is okay i don't i don't judge yeah, I know. I don't judge that, but it's but that's also part of my job. I mean, I feel yeah. like as an artist is to be aware. So it's like it's my job. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, and it's also how I'm wired, but um, for better or worse, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's always interesting to me to hear sort of like some of the economic behind the scenes of of art, you know, because there are some. There, it's starting to get out now. There's there's that art slash work book, and uh, I mean, Seven Days in the Art World maybe isn't like the right book to accurately describe Seven Days in the Art World for the middle of the road artist. But yeah, or for least, yeah, yeah. But it's still a good entry point. For yeah, sure. yeah. It's a it's yeah. a it's a start, and I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, 
I don't know if you saw the or um, but the Occupy Man project, which it, that lasted for a year, and that was a. Um, uh, I publicly disclose all of my finances, uh, all my income and expenses in a Twitter account, and uh, and then in a Google document that anyone could access. So that was like, like the extreme of sort of accountability in my own personal yeah. finances, but also as like what it, you know what it takes or how, where my money comes from. And, yeah. uh, and that's something that I think about a lot too, particularly yeah. that, again, not a lot of artists are willing to talk about. The ones that are selling aren't always so quick to tell you who their collectors are because a lot of times their money, those collectors got their money in really not so great ways. Yeah. And, you know, so. And, in, I, and, as, and as artists, we don't really have the luxury of asking too many questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and part of what, you know, I wanted to do, even if I, you know, I didn't want to disclose buyers information, um, yeah. you know, in that document, but at least it, it holds me accountable that I see that number, you know, and where that, yeah. and luckily, you know, the, the oil oligarchs weren't buying a lot of my collages in, in yeah. 2011, but or 12, but, um, but yeah, it's something that I, that I think about a lot. And, um, and again, it's, as much for me, like being a process oriented person, like I like to understand how these things work, but then I just like to share. I, like, I think it's important that, like, yeah. you know, it's not, and this actually also came out of hashtag class. And I remember, like, on a very, and I think I talked about this somewhere before, but, you know, there we, I was in one of the sessions one day, and, uh, and I think Ed uh, was talking about um, how much it costs to run the gallery and what their expenses are. And I can't remember how it came up, but basically I just started writing out my expenses and like on the board and just like laid them out. And I, and it was sort of like terrifying to realize how little like my expenses are, but then how little my income was, but it was also really liberating at the same time. And I looked around the room and it's like, Whoa, people are like, you can't do that. Like, that's not okay. You know, and it's it really is talking about money in that way is such a taboo. And yeah. you know, we have so many issues. It's like sex in America. Like we're so messed up about yeah. it um, sure. that we can't have healthy conversations about it. Yeah. Um, and it's like money is, I mean, money management, it's like it's always, you know, get rich quickly or, you know, stumble upon your million dollar idea and develop it, that kind of thing. But really yeah. like the long term, you know, wealth, is is a matter of doing like boring stuff yeah. like yeah, yeah. cut your expenses like I put know. away a teeny bit yeah you know, and the day to day sort that. of maintenance of things and I yeah. mean you know I'll be very clear I'm still terrible at managing my money like I have so yeah. little of it that not that hard but like yeah. you know that is still very much like you know something that I'm an ongoing project in the, in the yeah, life of man you know I know the feeling yeah. <laughs> But but again, like I think the important thing for me has always been to not treat it like I'm a victim and to just be very like again, transparent and upfront about what that, you know, what that is and the relationship to the art. Um yeah. and I think you know, most importantly now, this pardon me, in this particular phase is looking at like, okay, transitioning from being a full time artist to, you know, working part time to supplement the income, what does that look like? And yeah. um, so I don't know. But yeah, I think I think I hope that you know moving forward, more artists are willing to talk about that aspect, and more artists that are like critically engaged, that are critically um, minded, and willing to participate in the contemporary art world. And part of what I see is people that get so disillusioned, or you know, bitter, or whatever that, however that might manifest itself, that leave the art world because they're like, this is crazy. Um, or on the other end of the spectrum, you have people, you know, the artists that quote unquote make it, and then you know they're they're folded into the system so that you know they're much less likely to be critical or to to speak out while still being a member of the sort of team, whatever that really means, but to be part of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really I really loved um, reading like Damien Hirst's like interview book. It's like several hundred pages of interviews done over like twenty years or something. Oh like wow! That. And. Uh, and I mean, it's hard to think of him like having to work, you know, a construction job and live in a hovel. Yeah. But, you know, there was a point where, where he was. And, and I think one of the one of the things he said was like at the times when I couldn't afford to make art, I would just like do a drawing of it, plan it out and shelve it for later and, and come back to it when when the money rolled in. Yeah, and totally. I, you know. That's been like my favorite working piece of advice, you know, just yeah, yeah, compile yeah. ideas and then when you're well, ready, and, you can just. 
You know, it's funny because I was just, uh, I, the other day, well, a while ago, actually, I had this idea for a neon. I've never worked in neon before, but yeah. I always like, I like wordplay and having fun with stuff like that. And I was thinking about one where it just says no show and the no is blinking on and off. So the joke is that like, it's an, a gallery show that's a no show. So it sort of works on those layers like that. So it's an exhibition, but it sort of doesn't exist or the artist isn't there. And, um, and, and so like I wrote it in my journal and ended up making it into this uh like by chance into a video that I was doing for Vine. But then I was like, well, I can make uh, a poor man's neon, which is an animated GIF. So I ended yeah. up making a GIF out of this and then just posting it to my Tumblr and like getting the idea out there and just posting the content. And I think that's one of the amazing things about, you know, the access that we have to, to these platforms that we can get ideas out there in front of an audience that otherwise would have just stayed in my journal, you know, and no one would have seen it. It doesn't mean that it's a good idea. It doesn't mean that it's interesting, but for me, it's at least like, you know, even if I can't afford to make that a neon right now, I can get the idea out there. Yeah, and so exactly. part of it is then building that like history where I have all of these kind of like, some of them are strands, some of them are like thought out and executed performances, but it's all there, you know, um, yeah. or at least most of it. And that's been like, I don't know, such an important like relief for me when I feel like, man, I can't. Like there's this thing I want to do, but I can't do it. So I can get I can get the idea out there for people to see. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, and and like the relationship of neon to an animated GIF is like pretty perfect, you know? Yeah, totally. It's like that, I just, that like multi, like two or three fr frames flashing. Yeah, you know, over I, and I over. called it poor man's neon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, and it's such a great idea, you know. And and now like you know, there's a whole struggle to to like you know, while well, loads of artists are doing like these animated gifts, like how do we, you know, how do we deal with that? You know, how do, how do they get archived and displayed? And Yeah. The archive thing is interesting for me. I was, you know, I've, I've gotten into, I don't know, some level of verbal tiffs with people about, um, I just said verbal tiff. I, I don't really know. <laughs> I think it's just a tiff, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just a tiff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, something's not right about what I do. But, um, <laughs> No, but I, I have different opinions about just archiving stuff in general and and digital archiving, and yeah. I don't. Know, I'm I'm a little bit maybe more reckless with that sort of thing, and and how that, I don't know, and and how that manifests itself. Like I love link rot, for example. I kind of like the ephemeral nature of how you post something and it can get completely buried and lost, you know. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many posts I have on my Tumblr over the last few years, but it's like thousands. And yeah. I love, like, you can't really find anything in there unless you, like, get yeah. linked to it somewhere else, you know? And so, I don't know. But, but the, you know, the criti from a critical standpoint, there's definitely, you know, a growing interest in the art world in, in terms yeah. of that format, yeah. which has been in the works for a little while now. But, um, yeah. Yeah, which to some degree I'm interested in that conversation, and to another degree it's like I'm just making what I want to make, like you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. and I mean, uh, you know, we we all kind of saw what happened to digital archives with what was it, um, uh, was it Bitforms or something like that? The, oh yeah, they they lost so yeah, yeah they were, like were everything. Kind of, um, uh, I think it was iBeam storage, which was uh, yeah, in, yeah, that's right. Sleep. Yeah, I know, yeah. and I, I haven't followed up actually with what that. You know, but but then again, it's like I respect. It's it's tricky because I do think that work that people are doing is important and should be preserved to some degree. But how it gets preserved, you know, and yeah. it's just it's, a slippery slope because I wouldn't yeah. want anyone's. I guess what I'm saying is like I wouldn't want anyone else's work to be destroyed. Like I don't, yeah, yeah. you know, I can't support that. And I feel like if people want to preserve their work that way, it should be, and that's for other people to decide. So then, therefore, it's kind of hypocritical of me to be like yeah. <laughs> you know, anti-conservation. But yeah, um, but then there's you know yeah. some things that that are it's like part of of the whole medium that it's that it's a temporary you know, time-based thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, you don't think of, like, an animated GIF as, as, like, necessarily, like, impermanent, but in a way, it, it, it kind of is, you know? Yeah. It can easily get deleted, disappear, get, and just get buried under, like, the total noise that's, yeah. that is Tumblr. You know? and, I, and I feel like I, I, sometimes I relate it to, like, the documentation of performances from the early 70s. Um, 
yeah. thinking about how this documentation literally could have just been a single photograph from something that happened, you know, like the yeah. Vito Kanji following piece and, and a few more photographs. But, you know, something that's so almost like ephemeral that represents the idea and then, you know, the digital equivalent of that and what that, how that represents itself, you know. And I think there's something that's kind of, I don't know, it's really appealing to me that the actual thing might be lost, but there's this sort of remnant and like, yeah. or even like as simple as tracing it back to the, who the original author of something and the original content creator was for a GIF and sort of the, the history of it. And that sort of thing gets interesting to me and, and how you can't always figure out like where something came from. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I've heard it called the, the democratic forest, you know, the idea that because everyone can exactly. like publish now that it sort of becomes really tough to find trees. And, uh, yeah. and David Foster Wallace, I think he called it total noise yeah. talking about like creative writing majors coming up, you know, and yeah. getting produced. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's like, I guess that's part of the whole like art world machine is that it does, you know, it turns out a lot of people to, to enter into it, but it also like hashes, everyone up you know yeah. regardless of of the status you know yeah and uh, you know, sorry go ahead no it was it was i mean i mean i guess like damien hurst even you know almost his career almost got shot down when you know Sachi like offed all of his collection all at once and he had to run around to try to get funding to buy it all back yeah or he before he wouldn't be selling like any work at all right yeah I mean, yeah, I had a thought, and it flew away. Crap. I hate sure, it we'll, we'll come back to it, probably. Yeah, something about things. Oh, it was, um, yeah, okay. Um, thinking about, you know, particularly in the online world and artists that are making work, and, and you know, I just finished this essay for uh, Hyperallergic about it, actually, so it's still, like, really fresh in my brain. But yeah. thinking about... Um, how, you know, to rise above the kind of noise, you know, to, to stand out in the, the forest, there are these tactics that different people are taking. And one of them is, you know, kind of, and it's, again, it could be attributed to an artistic voice, but like yeah. there are popular blogs out there that have very similar, you know, posts all the time. It's like, you know, pretty much what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, and th there's nothing inherently wrong in that, but I'm, I'm very, and I might like, something you know i might yeah. like those artists or what they're posting or, or those content creators um but i'm less likely to be surprised and i'm less yeah. likely to be challenged by that because there's a certain kind of um uh, almost like complacency if you know what might get a reaction out of people and what people yeah. might like or um or reblog or whatever that might be yeah. and, I, and i feel like as someone that's found myself in this position where um you know, I have a lot of Tumblr followers um, that, you know, are a result of being listed in a section of the Tumblr website, which is for, you know, spotlight artists. And so yeah. it's it's a very bizarre thing where to some degree I feel like I just wandered into a room and then all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, these people showed up. And like, yeah. I don't really know why anyone's here. And I'm like, cool, I'm so glad you guys are here. Why are you here? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's a little strange yeah. that way. Um, but I use it as a sort of like way to experiment with different types of content to see like what people yeah. respond to and what they don't. And yeah. sometimes I follow the things that no one responds to because I'm like, okay, I want to like go down this road yeah. because no one has like noticed this thing and that there's something in there. And then other times though, like I do find myself like, I know if I just post this photo of like, the subway that I think is kind of cool, it's going to get about 20, you know, interactions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's something really kind of perverse about that. Um, well, that, so, that's, that's another David Foster Wallace idea was that um, he was trying to figure out sort of like low and high culture. And, and he came yeah. on the idea that like that we're very diverse overall in our like highbrow and sophisticated tastes. You know, we hardly have any of that in common, you know, different directors, different authors, whatever, but we're all very common in our like base lowbrow taste. That's why pop music still sort of exists, you know? Yeah, totally. And oh. then that line, and then thinking about the number of people and then thinking about the types of, 
you know, blogs, for example, that might be the most reblogged or the most, and what those numbers mean. Yeah. You know, and, and the truth is they really, on the one hand, they don't mean anything. But on the other hand, you know, it leads to a perception of, of value. Yeah. And, and again, that's such a strange concept for me because, you know, it becomes almost like a weird uh, bargaining chip or it becomes this, it puts you in a position where, you know, of this perceived power, perceived level of taste making. And like, and there might be some truth in that, that, you yeah. know, um, I was actually having, I had a meeting earlier today about uh, this startup that I might be involved in in some capacity. And, you know, the person was sort of saying to, you know, more or less that I could be featured on this thing that would be in somewhat of a tastemaker position. And it's just a very bizarre concept, you know, like yeah. the, the whole thing is just kind of weird to me. And, you know, some days it's like, I don't care about what that role is for myself as a human being, as an artist in relation to that. And then other days it's like, you know, none of this matters. <laughs> like, yeah. like really, you know, the, the culture that we're creating, the the work that's being done that that I or anyone else is sort of putting out there has so little value that it's like probably not worth it at all. And I know that's terrible to say. Um, and I have a feeling that's really my own insecurities as like a as an artistic being and someone that's like sometimes very much like not able to process information. So like when yeah. when everything starts to crumble, then you know nothing makes any sense and it doesn't matter. You know. Um, but that's very much like just about every artist you'll ever talk to. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> think know? so too. You know, it's yeah. like, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a funny, funny thing that, um, that sort of popularity thing. And, um, and, uh, I just watched a, a seminar or with Ryan holiday over that went over like a couple of days and, uh, he's just a, a marketing genius. He does American apparel stuff. Yeah. Kids like 24, 25, oh, something yeah, like yeah. that. I'm so um, old. I know, right? Huge <laughs> amount of responsibility for somebody like for somebody that age, and yeah. uh, he was recommending to people that were coming up with products and and who are designers or photographers that they sort of like encode their marketing message in the creation of their piece, yeah. which in a one in one sense that sucks because it might start to like bend your work towards the lowest common denominator right. and not make it more interesting. You know, it, it might appeal, be more appealing, but not necessarily better. But on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, what we all do when we start thinking about like an artist statement or yeah. making, having a direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's that play. It's, I mean, you know, sometimes I view it as a dance and it sounds so cheesy, but man, um, the dance it's like a little ball you know? <laughs> um, but thinking about um you know pushing and and sort of like but then also kind of pulling and what you know what i'm putting out there versus what i'm putting out there and you know another way that i've been thinking about it a lot recently is um you know a lot of these kind of micro ideas or posts that are being published that i just put out there and they're like inconsequential you know yeah. Um, but then, you know, what, what does that look like over a long period of time, you know, anywhere from a month to a few years, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, uh, it's like on Kavara's, uh, yeah. date paintings, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's one a of them similar, is whatever, yeah. but you know, you start yeah. to see that they've been going on for forever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of, and it shifts the way that you think about it. And so like and those everything in between they can be you know again photos of the subway or it could be some really you know fancy project that i spent months like working on and getting out into the world you know yeah and to not value any one more than any other one but just to kind of have it all out there in this space and then to be able to just like have it there you know like and it just exists uh, so i you know i don't know i feel like I feel like there's something that keeps me creating in all these different sort of realms that is just about putting stuff out there. And yeah. And, and sometimes it's more geared towards like what I have to do no matter what. And then other times it's like, I wonder, like, I don't even know why I'm doing it. You know, it's like, I have to do this and I get it out there. Um, so yeah, had some other more, you know, 
interesting thought, but it kind of just flew away. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's like classic French postmodernism, you know, like, uh, I think it was Leotard that had the idea that, that, that humans are the only people that can sort of think the unthought, you know, yeah. machines can, can sort and do repetitive tasks, but they can't yeah. come up with new ideas, you know? Yeah. And I think that's like my favorite spot to be in, in terms of coming up with ideas for, totally. for art is that. Uh, is where I'm not even sure why I'm doing something yeah. or what it's going to look like, but I might yeah. have like a, a, a concept or like a word. So it's usually verbal for me. Yeah. You know, like, um, like whether it's, I'm thinking about black holes or I'm thinking about, you know, uh, like crashes or collisions or something like that, you know, that yeah, yeah. it's that something that I, that I can latch onto, but I don't know yeah. everything about it. Yeah. And then it's sort of like, to me, it's like enjoying that process of the discovery process and then whatever yeah. happens. And then, you know, one thing that I've been looking at a lot recently is my tendency to sort of to start something, to be really excited, get it out there, develop the idea enough. Yeah. And then by and then that time, yeah. I'm ready for like the next um, – because I'm a little like – fidgety school kid that's like okay i need a new idea I'm bigger i gotta think of the next thing and like it's not enough i need more you know um so that's something that but it, but then again going back to the process of drawing circles it's like working on one drawing for a year provides a certain kind of stability that you know and completion that might not exist in other ways yeah so just sort of allowing that process to be whatever that process is you know yeah um without killing it before it has a chance to you know be yeah. yeah. And then the circle drawing, you know, like long term, it, it's, it's funny because it's like both, both an organic and a mechanical thing, you know, you spend time in your head, but your, your hand does like the same thing over yeah. and over. It's very, it's, it's kind of ironic in that sense that you're, yeah. and again, you know, the dance between those two types of, of thoughts and types yeah. of time, you know. Well, and the reality is, and this is, um, you know, come out of doing these drawings for a few years is that while it's the same it's entirely different mm -hmm. and and that's a very zen you know the zen circle um and and spending a lifetime doing the same thing but it's different every single time and mm -hmm. so in that sense i sort of i'd call them like iterate iterative or iteration drawings and to some degree because it's not quite repeating it's like doing the same thing but different and every time it's sort of the same but totally different. And like the results yeah. are the same but they're totally different. And I yeah. feel like, you know, sometimes that gives me a handle on on reality where it feels like everything is totally different but it's also totally the same. It almost works in reverse. It's like, you know, all these things that seem so different are actually just a bunch of circles, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of gives this lens that can um, – ease some of the like overwhelming sense of like dude everything is really too complicated you know yeah and uh to kind of jump back to an earlier thread um, yeah you know I, I always think about the the times when uh you're on the outside sort of looking in and you maybe want to get a show and get your work out there yeah because um, i mean everybody has that experience and then it becomes sort of like Every day and underwhelming, sort of when it happens, yeah. To me, I you know, know. it's I like, know. and and then you realize that really it's not such a huge yeah. deal, yeah. That sort of exposure thing, yeah. You know, I've had a few different moments of that over the years where um, I was in one, I was in one particular group show, which was like the culmination of like basically all the work I had done. It was like a gallery I respect like about as much as any gallery that's that that I've ever known, let alone worked with. And I had this one moment and it was so brief of walking my piece for the install, you know, cuz I couldn't afford to have it shipped or cour couriered. So like I'm like walking this work over <laughs> and um but it was like it was a very brief moment of I've made it. Yeah. You know. And and it didn't last long because immediately there are all the other things come in, like, you know, is it um, who's going to come to the show? Is it going to be reviewed? Is it going to lead to the next thing? Is it yeah. going to sell? If it doesn't sell, what does that mean? If, yeah. you know, this person doesn't show, what does that mean? 
what is the relationship to the gallery thereafter and you know yeah. and all of these other things that come in right away in terms yeah. of the thinking and the the strategizing about the career yeah. but there was it's a so funny moment. because yeah. it's funny because like all that really doesn't mean much no you know in the it end doesn't mean anything. You know? i mean it, it means that you can you know you can begin to sort of develop you know, a relationship with other artists and, and yeah. with some collectors and meet some friends and, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then what I realized, too, is that, like, you know, there, the politics of, and I mean politics lovingly, but the politics of the art world and gallery shows and even grants and, and you know, curatorial projects and residencies and all of it, really, are you know, the, the type of energy that they require, mm -hmm. sometimes I really enjoy putting into that particular type of work. And sometimes I could just care less about it. You know, I'm very, I'm, you know, I have no, I like, I guess the way I try and like approach it is that I have nothing to prove to anyone. And that's like freed me up so much to yeah. just like, if I want to try and get into a gallery show, then I try that for a little while. And like, if that happens, great. If it doesn't, like, I'm not beholden to anything. And I feel like I also went in, went into the art career very much with that in mind because I had seen other people close to me that had certain ideas about what, what they wanted to accomplish. Um, and, and if those weren't accomplished on the timeline, then that creating an exorbitant amount of anxiety or sort of, you know, sense of failure or stress yeah. or whatever that might be. And just deciding at a very, like in the very beginning that, you know, I was going to have fun. Yeah. And if they stopped being fun, I was going to stop doing it. And, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and that's always been really important, especially when challenges come up that are like, okay, wait, am I still enjoying this, still having fun? And if not, like, I'm not going to be a crotchety old man that's, like, bitter that he didn't get a better show <laughs> or bitter that he's yeah. not on the yeah. cover of, like, Art in America or something. You know, like, like those yeah. goals, whatever they may be, like, are good for some people, but they're not. Ultimately, I have to believe that I'm making, and I do believe that what I'm doing, I have to do because I believe in it, you know. And, like, I, I think that, not that it's important and that anyone should look at it or that it matters, but because it sort of, like, gets me thinking about things differently in a way that maybe other people could then identify with or appreciate to some degree, you know. And, and, but to not put any, like, over-importance on that value. Yeah which we're so quick to do because we spend so much time doing it. So it's like we spend hours and hours in the studio. So we give it this sense of importance and we have curators and dealers and, and magazine, you know, ma magazines and, and blogs and, yeah. <laughs> you know, critics, you know, kind of propping this, the, the importance of this up without, you know, maintaining a healthy sense of reality about what we're actually doing. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, in a that, sense, we're, we're not really, you know, contributors to like the big you know culture as a whole and yeah i mean yeah. that's what i thought going out of school it's like i don't i don't really even want to be necessarily a, a huge part of of that you know yeah. i want to just like get a job and make money for myself and yeah you know I, i'd rather do something else whatever that is yeah and, and, and at the same time there's a sense that you know even if it doesn't look like I don't know. It can look a lot of different things. You know, it can look like small cultural advancements, or like conversations between two people. You know, like like that value. It, I've I've gotten so much more uh, like excitement or life fulfilling experiences out of. You know, when I'm just like talking to someone, they're like, "Oh my god, I totally agree with you." Like that's such a cool way. Like I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about life that yeah. way. And then that's how it ends up. I don't know, seeming way more valuable than like anyone trying to change the world. You know. So. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I kind of feel like at 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 bottom, like my desire as an artist is just to you know make stuff and have people see it, you know. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, and then sometimes when I'm in those moments where I'm like, oh, I want, I really want this this show to happen, you know, then I I say, well, you know, I open my studio every month and a couple hundred people come by and check it out and yeah, you know. And maybe sell some stuff and maybe don't, but yeah. uh, you know that that base goal is is met pretty continuously. So yeah, yeah. And I think that that's a that's a great goal to have, like first starting when you're out of art school. Yeah, totally. You know, 
especially because yeah. you don't know where your where your work is, and you might think it's really developed, and and you might get that backed up by your friends and, and right. teachers and stuff. But you put it out there, and you m- maybe realize that it's not at the yeah. level that you thought. Yeah, yeah. I just tend to keep deluding myself. I'm like, no, no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> I just need yeah, to keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll sure. catch up to me eventually. <laughs> yeah, I do that. I do that dance too. You know, it's like yeah. it's it's that it's that thing between. I I I know it's awesome. Yeah. But you know, maybe this isn't the piece that shows it. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and so you just kind of like continually delude yourself that, yeah. that you're gonna make these small incremental gains every time you make it work yeah. or uh, maybe every other time or every 10 pieces yeah and then the truth is like to trust to trust yourself or like i trust myself enough to know like when i've gone too far in the self-delusion <laughs> and yeah. when i need to like rein it in a little bit and actually listen you know and when then i need to like push forward in other ways and so that kind of you know it's always tricky to talk about faith in the art world but like that sort of faith in a process or faith in myself to know is like critical in those times you know because it just allows for you know a very honest conversation with myself and like okay i trust this or i don't and if i don't then i can back up and like the whole time i like trust that like you know again if if something comes of it great if nothing comes of it maybe that's what's supposed to happen and like that's okay too like it doesn't matter you know (laughs) like it really doesn't matter and at the same time you know it does. It matters because it's what we're doing. You mm-hmm. know, but yeah, and um, and I mean, I guess for I wanted to get something, get an opinion on this for maybe like people who are just thinking about setting up a studio or whatever. But how how is important is it to you to do things in sort of a group, like a studio group? Yeah, I mean. I will like in say terms I'm really of its physical setup, you know, like yeah, yeah, it's, totally. it's different between like setting up in your garage or, or in in a room than having a studio yeah. that that's maybe out in, in public a little more. Well, I will say this. Uh I've had a studio in uh Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh so Bushwick the neighborhood in yeah. the part of Brooklyn, which is for like I guess almost ever since I've been back in New York, so three years now. And um that has been on on a first level that was really important to me that I found a space in an artistic community yeah um, a community that inspired me where people where people were working hard and were um, that also seemed sort of like minded in some way so yeah. just having that around in a general neighborhood was really important for me first um, just that I felt like when I was going to my place like other people were doing the same thing yeah and at that particular time it was like man everyone was hustling in two thousand nine like the fall yeah. like like you got the feeling that people were really working at trying yeah. to sort of make it or say something or do something, and that motivated me. Yeah. Um, even if I like didn't know what anyone was doing, and I was still yeah. sort of like starry eyed, you know. Um, yeah. And and I've had a lot of different studio mates over the, over those three years, and only very recently have I had like a very, you know, professional is not the right word, but like artists that are very serious and dedicated towards the sort of longer term, like, um, it, I don't know. I mean, I guess professional maybe is the word I could use that are maybe showing or that are, um, wanting to show, wanting to be a part of these conversations and are, and, and have been in the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that that's really important from a motivational standpoint and that I sort of see what they're doing. I agree with a lot of the work they're making and it kind of holds me accountable. So if they're working in the studio, there's always this sort of like, oh, you're working? I'm working. Oh, you're taking a break? I'm going to keep working. You know, like, yeah. like <laughs> it's sort of like this kind of healthy, um, yeah. you know, he- healthy competition, even if it's only in my own head about yeah, yeah. Um, what I'm kind of doing in my own space. So to me, it's been really important. And also, like, I've, it was m- more important that I have a space that's separate from where I live. Um, yeah. I think I've had spaces where I live and it's really hard to like, for me to maintain a kind of practice and a headspace. So, you know, I try and show up at the studio every day if I can, even if I'm not doing anything, I'm just sitting there or writing emails. I'm at least in that physical space, yeah, which yeah. is like only for that. And, um, and it's a luxury that I've, you know, I've worked really hard to be able to have that space that I have, you know? Yeah. Um, 
because space is so expensive. So it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's really, <laughs> that's like, the, uh, that's the trade off, you know, like I, I'm in, I'm in, uh, Boone, North Carolina, which is like, you know, pretty dinky town, but, yeah. but each of us pays like one twenty five a month for our yeah. studios. And yeah. we have like overall, like a couple of thousand like square feet that we've divided up. And, uh, and we yeah. have, you know, a, uh, a, public work workshop that we that we all split up yeah 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 and it's like every time i tell that to my new york friends they're like i hate you so yeah, much like, like oh, <laughs> not cool yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. then again you know it's like you know it's a crappy crappy location there's no heat there's barely water sure you know, sure the ceilings may be like 80 inches high you know yeah. it's like you can <laughs> reach over your head and touch it and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But it's but it's perfect for us because it's like we all want to be in sort of uncomfortable locations. Yeah. And and get really motivated to work sort of because yeah. of that. Yeah. And uh, and that's basically like sort of has is most of what's kept my like practice alive. Yeah. Being yeah. being in that group. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, of course, you go a little crazy not making art for a couple of weeks. Right. If you if you take a break, you know, but. Uh, yeah. Really, it's that group and seeing other people develop things and being able to like bounce ideas yeah. off each other. That's and it's great that, that you mentioned that because I was lucky enough to get included into a, a crit group here in New York with um, you know some friends of mine that I knew through uh, initially through uh, an artist collective in Long Island City called Flux Factory, and um, and one of the members there um, started this group, and so we meet just about once a month, and um, and that's been really like such a, an important part of my practice to like meet with the same people every month. You know, yeah. I didn't go to art school, so this is kind of like my like art yeah. school by fire, you know, but, um, yeah. And I'm terrible at it cause I, I'm not good at taking criticism at all. And, um, so that, I, is, one, that is the one, the one big advantage of like art school, I think is that you develop the alligator skin yeah. uh, really, really pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that is definitely something you need if you're going to put work out in front of people. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I've been at shows where people have just like trashed trash my, my work and, yeah. you know, or say just really stupid stuff. And you have to yeah. just be able to like, yeah, you know, let it let it roll. You know, dirt off my shoulder. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's something that from just from an advice standpoint, if you can, you know, find a group of people to meet and have sort of a steady conversation because what ends up happening is, you know, these people have seen my work over, I guess, I don't know how long we've been doing it, a year or so or longer now, you know, so there's a history that gets built in. And, um, yeah. and that was also advice that someone had given me well before this group even started that just yeah. sort of came about randomly. But, um, yeah, so space and, and groups of people and, you know, yeah, it's, I think, and the other sort of aspect of that is like for me, it's always been being very, to some degree, clear to myself about what my objectives are and what my goals are. Yeah. Um, but then not having any attachments to any outcomes for like how life is supposed to look or how a career is supposed to look. Mm -hmm. And again, I, like from so many people that I meet, and I think especially in New York where people are hustling, man, we're working so hard, and then like, and it kills a lot of people, not literally, but like, you know, it's it's really tough here. It's just tough. Um, and uh, if if you if it's tough if you are a driven person and if you want to like quote unquote make it because yeah. the competition is so high um, because there's you know only a few spots and so many people are looking for the same spots. But um, one of the things that's helped me a lot in the sort of last couple of years is just like being clear about what I'm doing, but then yeah. also just being totally open to like not having to have it turn out any particular way. You know. And I feel like I've met a lot of people that, you know, they either move on or they get disgruntled or, or like life happens in other ways. Yeah. Um, and some people deal with that better than other people, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that's just such a big, a big part of like not only making art, but about sort of even just living in general is, you know, I, like... And some of the work that I make, you know, sort of hinges on that idea of, of not really knowing at all what it's going to turn out to be, Yeah. you know, and, and being okay with either taking that idea and just like throwing it in the trash can or, you know, sitting and letting it grow on you, you know, and, yeah. and, 
I think that's like a really critical mindset that, uh, as far as everybody that, that I know that's been in, in, in art for a long time, like they all have that sort of idea. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah they're going to, they're, we're definitely going to try to push, push the career ahead, yeah. you know, but at the same time, if, if that push, you know, results in something like in that direction, yeah. it's like, cool. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, you might get married, you might have a kid and, and yeah. then, you know, that sort of changes like. <laughs> What's pri- happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> changes, changes priorities and yeah. like things shift around and, 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 uh, and I mean, you know, there's no reason that, that art can't accommodate all that too. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, to me, it's like, I totally hear that. And I think it's, I think the me from like four years ago or like three years ago might have felt very differently. But mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I just, I feel like, you know, I, there's a sense that if we can find what our, our real strengths are and just play to them, like yeah. whatever those strengths are, I just have to trust them, you know, and I have to follow them wherever they lead, you know, and it's really kind of as simple as that. And it's like not staying in one thing longer than I should. You know, yeah. and, and not leaving too soon and not being yeah. afraid to really give it a shot and take, you know, taking every risk I possibly can. Yeah. And that was something that I, you know, because I have this background in theater, I spent almost my whole life up until I graduated college thinking that I was going to be a theater person. Yeah. I mean, granted, I'm still pretty theatrical, but, um, yeah, yeah. you know, there was this sense that, like, I'm going to be an actor or a director in the theater world. And I was very much in touch with that world. I was sort of conditioned to be there. And when I got out, you know, I, I got these theater jobs and gigs, uh, not really jobs, gigs, and, um, and I was miserable. Yeah. And in a very short amount of time, I kind of had to decide if I was going to stay in it or walk away. And, you know, there were enough external things happening in my life that I couldn't afford emotionally to stay. Like, I had to actually stop doing almost everything that I was doing because my life was falling apart. Um, but what that, what that forced me to do is then say, you know what, like, I'm not going to do this if it's not right for me. Like, it's yeah. not right for me anymore. Um, so, yeah. And I think that loops back into, like, if I stop having fun doing this, like, I'm not going to do it anymore because I know it. Like, I'm going to get all like, yeah, sassy yeah. about it. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to be that, like, you know, disgruntled yeah. theater person, you know, yeah. because the life's just too short, you know. And especially yeah. the older you get, it's like, you know, finding those ways where, you know, you can make it meaningful, but then also have fun. And yeah, like, yeah. I was thinking about that recently. Like, I really love having fun wherever I can. And that's really hard. And right now, it's like, you know, I am so broke right now. I am like beyond broke. And, um, you know, bills, everything's due and late and everything. And so it's sort of like trying to keep a sense of humor through all that is great. Yeah. Then it's also like, no, this is a little bit beyond like, you know, you're sort of beyond denial into like, I don't know, whatever is after that about what the financial situation for me is like right now. And so, um, and so that's where it's like, okay, you know, it's time to like really get a, get a handle on, on myself, you know? Um, so that it's basically so that I can have fun again, you know, it's as simple as that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't know, I guess, uh, I mean, like I came to art late as well. I mean, I did go to art school, you know, twice. Um, but I hadn't decided on art until I was thoroughly into college and in totally the wrong place. And and I think it just comes back to like being a being like a kid and sitting around with friends and like having good fun nights of drawing. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And like I don't know, I just I think everybody everybody can do art and draw until they learn they can't. Yeah. You know? and, and that's kind of like kind of a, a sad thing in, in a way, but then a lot of people return to it. Yeah. And it's interesting to see like that you haven't, that you haven't gone through school, but then you've come up with some ideas that are ridiculously sophisticated, especially uh, being able to write on the beginning front of that, think through the implications of like social media art and how that's, yeah. and how that was going to like happen. Um, well, what's just funny about that, I mean, just really briefly, is that, you know, that's where I just trust my life. And, you know, I was always yeah. interested in computers from when I was a kid. And, like, when I quit theater, you know, I quit the theater and I said, I'm just going to be a normal working person. And I got a job at randomly as a telemarketer at a web design company and then was hired to be a web designer because I sucked at telemarketing, which then got me more interested in the technology 
you know, the technologies that were being developed in the, you know, starting in 2003. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's sort of the birth, the birthing of social networking. And, and even before that with, uh, with Friendster and being sort of a part of that from a pretty early age. So it's sort of like, you know, for, for me, for pretty early age. And so, yeah. like, having that background without any, like, intention of turning it into an art practice or any intention of doing anything with it, but then just because it was an interest, you know, um, and that has ended up benefiting aspects of my career in ways that I couldn't have foreseen. But I'm just like following what I'm interested in, you know. It's like I think this particular thing is really fascinating. Like what people are doing with this and the potential and then inventing potential if there's no potential. And like and particularly like I think with Twitter was a great example where, you know, and I think it's pretty much gone all the way back to reverting. But there was this brief period of time where it was like hit kind of critical mass. Everyone, you know, a lot of people were using it that weren't just the tech geeks anymore. Yeah. And, you know, there was this place where you could create something that, you know, art, art people or average, average people, you know, an audience could sort of experience and in a way that had never really happened before. And that potential I'm still very much fascinated in um, yeah. and using technology that people are writing off because people are just saying like, oh, Twitter's where you go where you talk about sandwiches, you know, like what you ate for lunch. That's what you're yeah. going to tweet. So like yet, you know, people don't take it seriously. Yeah, and yet yeah. at the same time, there's there are those tools that that basically pull up all the images from your Twitter feed, yeah. which that's I always think of that as like the coolest idea for for Twitter and just like taking that and turning it visual, you know, and and creating like a sort of some work just for that. And I think that's that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. But then again, you know, it's like um, the social media thing does now have like you know a pretty awesome real world effect you know like i had i met a few people that that have become like really important in terms of like my sort of art uh art life and and just from like going to new york and like checking in someplace on foursquare somebody yeah. will come up to me and go like are you me and i'm like weird like, whoa. <laughs> yes yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it's really and i think you know what i'm thinking a lot about now um, on a you know on, on a few different levels on a personal level on an artistic level and then on a career level um, those three things being very different from each other um, you know the implications of where things to be he- where things seem to be headed um, and like trying to get you know because I think and part of it is because I didn't go to art school so I feel like I've learned everything kind of as I'm doing it and mm-hmm. I've like for the past couple of years sometimes I feel like I'm you know the things that I'm doing or creating are like were created however many years ago and I'm like catching up, you know. So it's like I'm doing my own art history but like in real time as I can kind of process and get to the point of yeah. like what is current and I'm like still not quite yet there yet but I'm like getting to the point where I can like conceptually envision the moment, you know, and not just be conceptually envisioning things that happened, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, many years ago or even recently. And I feel like that's where I'm trying to get to this point where, you know, not trying to predict the future but understand you know, how we are using this right now and, mm-hmm. and what the implications are for yeah. what is going to come next with how we communicate and how yeah. we share information and ideas and culture. Um, and I don't, and I'm like, it's like, you know, when you're close, it's like, it's yeah, there, yeah. like I can, <laughs> can like feel yeah. it and like I see it playing out, but like, so anyway, so, and that's where I'm the most excited, you know, like a, like a kid in the candy shop. Because it, it all this sort of potential comes up again. And and I had gotten burnt out on, you know, these sort of Twitter performances, for lack of a better word. And, um, you know, I did so many of them in a pretty short amount of time that, like, yeah. I just didn't really know why I was doing them anymore. And, like, yeah. the engagement wasn't the same as it was. The audience had shifted, you know, um, for better and, and, you know, worse, quite frankly. But, you know, and so just that sort of relationship changing, um, has led to this period of the last like about year or so of really rethinking yeah. what that looks like and what engagement can kind of how engagement can manifest. So yeah, I think that's pretty pretty fascinating. It it, it I mean I don't think it, it's good that you mentioned Vito Conti because I don't I don't think he was trained in in art school either. Oh, I think interesting. He had a, I think he'd had a, a literary uh, background and uh, and so there were, there are a lot of pieces that sort of had to do with with like learning in in the moment like i think there was one where he was like learning to play a song or something and that the performance went from when he started learning it to when he could play it through oh and uh 
Yeah. And and I, I I think that's like a commonality that like the the untrained artists have is like that they're working in a way like more directly with their sort of specific medium or whatever ideas they're attracted to. Yeah. They don't, it's sort of a little more investigative. And I see that in in my friend that does stone carvings, like in, uh, in, in my studio group, you know, he's like, um, really struggling sort of with a lot of like ideas that I would go and, and say, well, that's a little old, like, you know, people have been doing that for a while. And, uh, and, then other times like he'll just sort of like surge ahead into like all these different areas that are pretty fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's cool to see like that happen. Yeah. And I think I've always tried to use it as kind of like, um, I don't know it to me, I was always really grateful that I didn't go through art school because I don't know, I was less accountable that way. I mean, it, I'm accountable. I'm accountable in, in so much as, you know, doing my homework, doing the research, seeing what, you know, other people have done on my own. But then it's sort of like, no, I, I can do this. Like the other day on Saturday, I was, uh, uh, my, my fiance was like at a party and like on the other side of town and, and I wasn't really feeling that great. And I like needed to go home, but I was kind of like in this, I didn't know what to do. Like it's really rare nowadays that like, I don't, have anywhere to be or like yeah. <laughs> somewhere to like, you know, like yeah. I, I'm supposed to be making dinner. Or I'm supposed to be like at the studio or I'm meeting this person and, and it's great. And don't get me wrong. I love very much love to have a busy life. That's one of the reasons why I still live in New York. But when you're, re- when you're faced with that moment of like, whoa, mm-hmm. suddenly I have free time. And, and what I did was I just went into the subway station and I, and I listened and it happened to be this uh, Cora player who was playing and this gorgeous music and it sounded like a steel drum but it sounded like there were 10 musicians and it's just this one guy singing excuse me and um and playing this beautiful music and i just sat down and i just started listening to him you know and i sat there for probably an hour and a half and 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 after a few minutes i i decided that i was going to sit there and this is, you know, this amazingly, you know, New York uh, stereotypical, like, yeah. busy subway with, like, thousands of people rushing by literally, yeah. like, every minute. And, and I'm sitting there as still and sort of quiet watching all this happen. And I just said to myself, you know, I'm going to create this kind of mini performance for myself, which was, you know, I'm going to sit here until I recognize someone or until someone recognizes me. Yeah, and and thinking about all the people that I know and who know me or who might know me, yeah. um, and and what that means for my relationship to like sitting in this one spot while this musician yeah. is sort of playing, and what I found, and again, like I just did that because I was like, wow, look at all these people. Like, I wonder if I know any of them, you know? And yeah. because I'm like looking to connect, and and then what I found is that I I was looking at people. And I was like, oh, that looks like so-and-so or that person looks like this other person yeah. that I know. And realizing then suddenly everyone seemed familiar. And I yeah. was using that lens for it. Yeah. Um, That's interesting because so anyway, yeah. it's so different from, from my existence because like I like that project anywhere in, in Boone would take about three seconds. On the way to go sit Site someplace specific, to try yeah. that, you would see like five people. You know, yeah. like, well, what's <laughs> actually really funny is that uh, just the other day I was standing outside and I literally like, I was like, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to stand here until I see someone I know. And then literally like a second later, someone that I knew walked by and it happened to be yeah. in my neighborhood. So it was like slightly more likely, but still like yeah, yeah. you could go weeks without seeing anyone you know in your neighborhood. And I just kind of laughed to myself because I was like, oh, yeah, there goes this artist that I happen yeah. to know, you know, walking by right now. So, yeah. but um, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty hilarious to think about, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, I, and, like, you know, I don't have contact information for most of the people that I know here. Cause yeah. You don't need it. You know, yeah. it's like leave the house. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. That's about all it takes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so, it's so small and, and tight knit here. And, yeah. uh, and it's just, it's, it's different I, in, in yeah. a way. Yeah. But there's also like, and that's where I think I'm looking for people that I recognize partly the same way that I'm looking to make order out of chaos, you know? And yeah. it's like, and if I were, 
you know, if, if the roles are reversed, I would probably be thinking like, I want to learn something from that person that I don't know. You know, like, what do I not know about this person <laughs> that like, that we know each other, but like, I wonder if they have a dog, like, or a cat, or I wonder what their animal's name is. And, like, that same kind of relationship to, like, the surroundings of, like, making sense of things. Yeah. But, uh, but I, anyway. do have, and, I do have the, the opposite moment happen, like, where I go someplace in town and I realize that I don't know anyone and yeah. how, how rare that is for me. Then that's, yeah. that's really, really weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember, you know, my, so I lived in Chicago for five years and my older brother was actually had lived in Chicago also for five years, but I think in the nineties at some point. And um and he actually told me once that he's like, Chicago has a lifespan of five years. He's like, you can live and we're both, you know, from the East Coast originally, so that's probably part of it. But he was like, you know, after five years, you will know everyone in Chicago. No matter just yeah. even though it's a big city, like you can't go anywhere without seeing someone you know after you've been there for that long. And I found that to be true. And you know, and so I was sort of like at this place where I was like, oh my God, like I'm seeing people I know everywhere, partly because I know a lot of people, but partly because like the world gets that much smaller, you know, mm-hmm. um, when you've been, when you've been there for that long, even some place that seems so huge when you first get there. And so I think to some degree, I found that to be true sometimes in New York, but I'm also kind of like seeking that out to like make some sense out of like total chaos, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I don't. I don't no, know what that has to do with anything. No, it, it has everything. It has everything to do with it because, like, you know, like that in there somewhere is like the 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 nugget of advice, which I I think is like like I always think about when I move to a new town that like the first thing I do is like I pick up a hobby that has other people involved and I am a regular at like one or one or two places. And like immediately that builds like the order and you start building like building up relationships with people that way. Yeah. And I think it's like and I think like art can work the same sort of way. Like if you want to go and develop an art career, you know, you find the gallery you like and you just like go to every opening, yeah. go there every time like, you know, yeah. there's any kind of event and talk to people and, you know, eventually like you know, you get around to discussions of what do you do and you say, oh, well, I'm an artist, you know, totally. that's, and, and you're off, you know, it doesn't yeah. take, it doesn't take a whole ton of effort and it, yeah. and it can happen pretty quickly. Yeah, it can happen really quickly. And I think that's the, that's also another important, like, oh, it's almost like always be ready, you know? And like yeah. right now, for example, like yeah. I've learned and I love telling this story. Okay. So wait, do you have time to, for me to tell this story? Yeah, man. I, I, yeah, I have nothing really to do. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so um, it's one of my favorite, like, New York uh, stories. But basically, so I was um, – uh, I had just gotten back from traveling, and I had I found a sublet. And, um, but I needed to, like, leave the sublet. I'd been there for however long, and it was yeah. time for me to, like, um, to go because the person was moving back in. And I hadn't found a place to live, and it was the morning that I was moving out. So literally, I had packed my bags. And I didn't know where I was living. Like, I didn't know yeah. where I was going next. And I was, like, walking out of that room. Like, my stuff sort of in the, like, in the living room. And yeah. I was, like, I don't know where I'm going. So, like, I guess I'm going to go make a cup of coffee. You know? I was, like, okay, go make coffee. And, like, as I was going to make coffee, I got a call that I had been accepted into this residency. And uh, I was, like, great can I move in now? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, great. I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> and like, it was like that fast where yeah. like literally, okay, I don't know where I'm going to like, I found this place in like the same amount of time, you know, that yeah. like, and, and, and that level of, you know, a lot of people rightfully so like, that's a lot of anxiety. I mean, for most, any yeah ordinary human being and so but I always try to remember that and like similar things have happened you know and it on a on a very frequent basis with finances too it's like okay um wow this is really at the like this uh, something's gonna happen here and then something comes through you know um and so to have that sort of like you just never know when anything's gonna happen and and taking that that those risks and being willing at every step along the way to like for me to check in like I believe I believe in what I'm doing, and even if I fall flat on my face, I'm willing to like take that risk to just do it anyway. Because like, why not? And the truth is, like, everything. The, our country is so messed up right now that like I got nothing to lose, you know? Like, yeah, right. I mean, it, it, it's <laughs> like, man, things are so backwards, and like, 
and I still love this country and I want us to succeed, but like, yeah. man, you know, it's challenging times. And, and there's, a, you know, on my pessimistic days, there is not a lot to like be looking forward to right now. It's like yeah. the world and like the global state of affairs and our role in like the downfall of human civilization. <laughs> um, yeah. but, you know, but there's always, there is always sort of like potential for either direction. You know, I read, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I read like Matt Ridley's rational optimist book and that was kind oh, of a cool. nice dose to, to hear like, um, to hear like someone that was saying the world is pretty good and has gotten better since like a million years ago, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and even, even a hundred years ago, like, you know, there's so much that has been done in terms of medicine and quality of life and yeah. things like that. And even since the fifties, like even in a recession, we're better off then. And just, even though there's, there's like some contentious stuff and some stuff that's ridiculous. It was good to like hear that sort of voice Very of positive good. dissent, yeah. you know, yeah. in a way. And I always try frankly, to, frankly, we need a lot more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And it's, and, uh, it's, it's hard to come by and, it, and it's sort of revolutionary in a way too, yeah. that, that someone's thinking those ideas and, and trying to back them up. Yeah. You know, with, with fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or at least great. Sort of I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Because, you know, the, I have, like, I do believe, like, I do have faith in, you know, even if sometimes, and, and I will say, as much as I love New York, like, it can be very easy some days to be a very cynical human being and a very, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it, it's just true. Like, New York is, is a very difficult place. And I, and the, it, the types of people that New York attracts tends to be of a certain variety that like I found in my experience here for the past few years, I'm like to some degree I'm becoming more and more like that, you know? So it's yeah. like more and more over here, over here, you know, yeah. and like trying to like rein it back in. And so yeah. I see that happening, you know, but, um, try and maintain some perspective on like, you know, being so negative or so cynical all the time and to like, maintaining a kind of positive and and not always a naive positivity but really like yeah you know having having a, a kind of belief system that is grounded you know and it is ultimately um positive mm -hmm. yeah but, yeah that's a and that's a tough spot to try to try to maintain in yeah especially in the art world man people yeah. love you know people love negativity they love the dark stuff they love the devil you know i mean like yeah. the darkness darkness tends to sell and what i've been thinking about recently is that like you know i think and actually seven days in the art world was that it was the first inclination of what was really happening there because it actually talked about you know, God being the art and, and how the art world, the, the, particularly the market, is, yeah. you know, the God becomes the art. And, and that becomes a very, like, tricky faith system and belief system. And, yeah. you know, when you have people that have made, you know, tons and tons and tons of money, you mm -hmm. know, those types of people are going to be likely to spend their money in ways that would acquire work that might represent a version of humanity that I don't agree with you know yeah, yeah. And, and, a, and a type of being you know look at man so many so much of work that like is kind of promoting a sensibility or an aesthetic that that seems really broken it seems really like fundamentally flawed um, so yeah. by the way can you hear that my, one of my roommates in the background playing guitar just barely oh, okay cool I was like oh man so New York you know yeah. <laughs> like anyway but, well, there's, uh, there's bound to be a bit of background background noise every once in a while. You yeah. know, I think about it too. Like, um, like for me, it's been very important to not just do art and to yeah. really bring ideas like from other like areas. For a while, like I was thinking about like old jazz and like and like old school swing dance and stuff like yeah. that, and like you know, bringing like energy and and rhythm and structure out of that because it's yeah. like a heavily structured thing. Um, and, and, you know, like always keeping something like physical and like, you know, oriented towards like the body and keeping just moving. Cause I feel like, you know, you get like, you get the thing where you, you know, you start out, you know, in your art career and you're like standing up and making stuff and eventually you're like hunched over a desk, like yeah, you know, yeah, your yeah. posture just like <laughs> <laughs> sort of crumbles, you know? And that's sort yeah. of like one of those, you know, even with Speaking the body, which, I need studies, to sit up. you know, like, <laughs> It's like one of those things, you know, that's like, you know, you get, you do wind up like, 
in that cycle of of like inactivity pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, Thanks. which is which is I think again like one of the great things about you know both online culture and um, in New York City separately is that there's so much stimulation in terms of new thought, new ideas, new. I mean, unfortunately, it's detrimental sometimes because it's new, 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 new all the time, yeah. um, and which can have you know adverse effects. But the the positive, the upside of that is that you know I'm constantly engaged and I'm constantly challenged to to rethink the things I think. You know, yeah. and and as an artist, it's like such a, I don't know, it's a blessing to be able to do that. The difficulty in that is that once you've developed a market for yourself, which you kind of need to do to some degree to get either critical exposure, to get yeah. gallery shows, you know, to have a market, um, the challenges kind of become a little bit more complex if you want to play in the game if you want to play on the field you've got to mostly play by the rules and yeah. those rules are incredibly rigid and incredibly strict so i mean talk about dance it's like it is a really fine dance between you mm -hmm. know pushing the ideas and creating a product and which unfortunately ultimately is a luxury commodity i mean if you're selling yeah. your work it is a luxury commodity and it yes. and that was talked about so much by you know William Pahida and Jen Dalton in, during class which you know it was really important for me to kind of hear and see and like allow to just be you know yeah, like yeah. it doesn't mean that luxury commodities are awful all the time but it's important yeah. that i recognize like the actual you know <laughs> the truth yeah. of the situation yeah um, and i would love and i would love for for more like new york artists to like come visit me in Boone and just like, you know, go out on like an art crawl night and see like what the prices are for all this stuff and yeah. like what you can get for like 20, 20, 50, 60 bucks, you know? I know. I and know. Um, like it's, it's incredible, yeah. you know, to me, like, you know, how little a lot of people around here are charging yeah. for their and work, you know? And it becomes, it's a, but it's to the point where it's like, it, it's a nice thing and it's not even really a luxury item, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's affordable. It, yeah. It's like 20, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 60 bucks, you know, yeah. like, and, and really well-crafted stuff too. Um, yeah. there's like a deep around here. There's like a deep respect for, for craftsmanship and yeah, like precision, yeah. which, yeah. uh, which I don't find necessary. I haven't really found that degree anywhere else. The current state seems to be that the, the ideas are valued, and not just the ideas, but the, the ideas in relationship to the conversation. Yeah. And that conversation with like a capital C in the art world um, is a very tricky one because there are these conversations that, that have been happening for a while, and you know, artists choose how much or how little to participate in them. And that sometimes has to do with the value of the work and sometimes nothing. But... You know, it's interesting because I think about the pricing of my work so much and it's really challenging because on the one hand, you know, I need and want to keep it affordable. On the other hand, in order to be taken seriously by the people that need that I need to develop my career to nurture it, then I have to charge more money. And so it's a really like yeah. You know, and but the, also the work has to be quote unquote worth that to someone, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know, the 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 actual price is one thing, what people are willing to pay. And, you know, on a very base level, the, the value of something is what people are willing to pay for it. Yeah. Um, and that's just such a, if anything, I tend to like, in relationship to the New York art world, you know, under price or undervalue most of the work that I'm sort of doing. Um, but it's just such a, it's such a fine line because quite frankly, you know, and I've heard this. I've actually heard uh, William Pahida and Jen Dalton both talk about this. That they can't afford their own work, you mm -hmm. know. And what does that mean? Like, and right now, even yeah. though my my work is still re very reasonably priced for for what it costs to make work in New York City, like I can't afford my own work, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's a really, um, I don't know. I think about it a lot, and I think about ways around that, and then. You know, I sort of compare that to what I'm trying to accomplish with my career. And, you know, and I believe that given enough time, like there can be other models that are sort of respected within modes of um, valuing work. I think even Tino Segal is kind of a great example of like a value that has been 
I have no idea how that happened, but Tino Segal can command a huge price for one of his commissions, mm -hmm. which ex don't exist except by a handshake, you know, and they're not allowed to be documented, and it's all pure conceptual art, and, um, yeah. and I'm fascinated by that on a lot of different levels, but, um, but I think about that in terms of, you know, not just a monetary modes of exchange, but you know, um, exchange of goods. And quite yeah. frankly, you know, at this point, it's like, what does it mean to exchange a collage for the relevant value of a certain, you know, a couple nights of dinner from somewhere, you know, and, yeah. and, and how, what does the money actually mean, you know? And the problem is it's so tied into the art market mm. that the perception is uh, is very difficult to tease apart from the reality of of what the art world is. You know what yeah, the art yeah. world is. Um, so, you know, and again, I'm I'm ambitious. I want to sort of keep putting work out there, and I want to be sort of taken seriously. And in order to do that, I've had to do a lot of work to sort of, in a very almost sometimes absurd way, point yeah. out some of these things which are very ridiculous. You know. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Um, yeah, it's I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about um dollar amounts and and how how those are determined, you know. And anyway, and the the, the truth is if if one day uh, I get a gallery that is going to be the sole sort of re, you know place that represents me and my work, they do all of that work. You know, yeah. so then, then I kind of like, oh, I get to wash my hands. Like, oh, I don't set the prices. The gallery sets the prices. Oh, it's not me, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's very convenient, I think. It's a convenient out to just yeah. say, well, they're the ones, you know, because they have the overhead, whatever. They have the collectors that are, mm -hmm. you know, then going to place your work in whatever collections and, and the curators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Anyway, so and, yeah. and for me, and then like, it circles all back around, you know, because that's how partly how we're here, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah, you know, and, and and it's 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 fun. It's fun to think about, and and it's like it is jumping down that rabbit hole too, you know. It's like you yeah. can you can be in that abyss, like circling around for for forever. I think. Yeah, literally but, forever. You know, I love I love going back and 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 reading about like you know people like Duchamp that didn't really make a lot of money off their art, you know, and just had sort of subsistence. How did Duchamp jobs. make his money? Uh, well, he, he, he was a, he, he was a librarian for a little while getting like, yeah. you know, minimum wage. And, uh, he would, instead of like selling his art, he would like trade it for a uh, six months or years with a rent payment. Right. Yeah. You know, and they would just oh. like, you know, write down yeah. a check to the landlord. And, and, yeah. and so, and then like late in life, he, he sort of became a secondary market art dealer and would sell off, buy stuff and sell it off like when he needed some money. <laughs> like yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. it was sort of, it's sort of funny to think about like someone like that who's basically got to all the ideas in the 20th century by like 1917. And yet, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Although I've heard, uh, Man, I, I wish I knew this off the top of my head, but I heard that the urinal idea, which is like the idea, was actually a woman's idea that he stole. Yeah, I'd have I'm to sure. look that up. Yeah, yeah. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of that, but I mean, it's, yeah. it sounds like something he would do, you know? Because, like, um, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of his his ideas like came out from conversation with with, with people, you know, and, sure. and his friends. Um, I think I'm just really sensitive to that because, like, I feel like I know that Duchamp is super important. He's 20th century art. Like, I mean, I, and, like, I love, I love Duchamp. Duchamp got me, like, excited about the potential for art. I looked at The Bride's yeah. Strip Bear by The Bachelors even for, like, an entire day the first yeah. time. I, saw it. I couldn't <laughs> leave it. I was, like, yeah. in the Philadelphia Art Museum and, like, my dad was, like, looking at the Titians and the Rubens and whatever, all the old masters paintings. And, like, I wandered in there and I, like, couldn't leave, you know. Yeah. But. But <laughs> like there is this idea of artistic legacy and and the myth of the artist and I really I really it rubs me the wrong way when you know these myths are created and then propagated and ultimately mm -hmm. end up you know 
empty become in, a way. in reality and they're empty that's the yeah, thing. yeah and it's that's what like, i think was yeah. so fascinating with like the people that that are like duchamp followers like um like sherry levine that did like the gilded yeah toilets. yeah yeah like that is just such an like an empty sort of thing and i was like okay maybe it's just because i've seen this in in like reproductions but i saw one uh i think in in one of the miami fairs and uh and i was like okay yeah this really is like just a totally empty thing yeah. You know, it, it was a it was a gesture at that time that, that like worked and and people have like repeated that idea of like doing like a gesture. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Over and over and and it doesn't really work all that that often it you know. Yeah. And then when it becomes like sort of codified it just becomes a shell and right. and, yeah. and no longer exactly. no longer very interesting. But I never and I never thought that that was what was vital about Duchamp, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, like, I don't know, to me, it, like, I'm always, like, I tend to approach art history, like, very, very suspiciously, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, I yeah. kind of don't trust anyone. I'm, like, a little paranoid, you know? Like, I'll, I'll try and look at the art for the art's sake if I can, read it without all the context. Mm -hmm. um, but that whole system gets very tricky to kind of parse really quickly, you know? Yeah. Um, and or, you know, on the flip side, it's just important, you know, if I'm following it to actually understand the full history of how these things came to pass. And that's where I get really fascinated. Like, you know, how is it that this X artist got codified or codified and X artist didn't? And, you know, who was connected to who, yeah. how did it happen and why, you know, and and what really made that happen? And is it some combination of the art being actually good or mm -hmm. is it who made it good, who said it was good? And um yeah. And that's something that I'm looking at now a lot with like this the newest sort of round of net artists that have kind of cropped up in a community and they're you know creating a particular type of work together and um, and it's being sort of institutionalized in various ways and you know looking at that as like the next generation of like this particular um, aesthetic of something that is being you know essentially manufactured as and and ultimately promoted as this particular generation of work. And it's very fascinating to watch that happen in like my own lifetime and to see, mm -hmm. you know, and to not be, you know, I don't make work that looks like that. Um, yeah. You know, and, and what does that mean? You know, then in relationship to my own sort of practice and, and process yeah. and thinking about it that way, it's really kind of fascinating. So yeah. I don't know. So. Yeah, that is that is pretty interesting to see like certain like ideas sort of crop up in in groups and then sort of get get promoted and um, I yeah. mean you see it with music all yeah, the time yeah totally you know? totally way way more than than art these days I think yeah. um, sort of it's tough to like group people together a lot of yeah. times um, yeah uh, yeah and definitely does happen some. Well, and I think ultimately the hope is that the best art rises above. I mean, if you're in the fray, so to speak, if you're part of the conversations, then, you know, it's funny because I feel like then this goes back to that spreading out work over a huge arc, a, a long period of time, that it ultimately will stand out from whatever was happening. Yeah. Like, like you, know, you look at Picasso's career, as much as I can't stand him as a human being and, like, how he was, yeah. um, you know, the phases of his career, I mean, that was a yeah. pro prolific dude. I mean, yeah. prolific in the amount of movements and the, like, styles, yet ultimately it's all Picasso, you know? Yeah. Like, Picasso is Picasso. It's not Cubism. It's not, you know, any of the other things that you could apply to, to work that yeah. falls into that category. And I feel like, I don't know, the best work is, is not, can't really be categorized that way. And So I don't know. And not... Not by any means am I comparing myself to Picasso, but oh, yeah. thinking yeah. about it, you know, wow. No, but it's fun to it's fun to talk about art history and and yeah. like um, I don't necessarily think it's like the the best artists like rise necessarily, but there's like states of tension that you have to have for your work to be like interesting. Yeah, or totally. For anything to remain interesting, and yeah, and it's like some people it becomes like too tense. And falls off the map, even though it could be really awesome. Yeah. You know? um, and At some stuff time like yeah. yes, and some stuff like like Thomas Kincaid maybe is like so comfortable yeah. that it's not going to be talked about. 
you know? Yeah. And it's like already since he's dead, you know, like he's basically dropped off the map probably for, for good. Yeah. Um, and I think of like, like from what I can, from what I found, like the very first surrealist was uh, Austin Osmond Spare, and, uh, and his stuff was like too weird and yeah. too like idiosyncratic to ever sort of be picked up by anyone and and he wound up like dirt poor you know by the time that he died and he lived i think into the 60s even or the late 50s and uh and you know i think it was only like maybe four or five years ago that that they had a retrospective at at one of the the tate sort of like galleries um involving his stuff and uh uh and it's interesting to see like that sort of person that's like been never really like except for some brief things when he first came out of out of like the academy or whatever yeah it's interesting to see like well he is like i mean he wrote his automatic drawing text in like like 1913 i think wow. and that yeah. wasn't even like a word or a concept until like 1917 like yeah. is when it's yeah. like created or like considered by like andre Breton. i think was one right yeah, i think yeah. and i think the dates are right on that i'm fairly sure um, sounds right yeah, it sounds about the right time, but it, but it's interesting that, that like nobody goes back and like, you know, finds well, yeah, that and, sort of thing. And part of that, and, and not to sound like, I don't know, um, a bitter <laughs> artist, but yeah. you know, there is a very real connection to power and money, and mm-hmm. the people that have the the money and power both um, to, you know, sanctify those artists. So the artists that get sanctified for whatever reason, because they play, you know, for who knows exactly why, but they become the ones that are written down. Um, And I guess, you know, the, yeah. And and that it's like, I mean, really it's like anything else. It's like who the, whose history, who history is written about. Um, And yeah, and it's by the people that are in the positions of most power within any given situation, you know, within yeah. any given time period. And again, like, I don't, I don't know. In a good day, there's something wrong with that. That's just how it shakes out, you know. But in yeah. and, and other days, it's like, you know what? Like, and, and part of the hope, and I think it's a utopian, idealistic, yeah. uh, <laughs> probably naive hope, is that the internet can provide some level of a level, level playing field within you know, people that would have any interest in this stuff at all. And so, you know, being able to have access to those images from 1913 and being able to see them side by side, even if they won't make their way back to whatever installation in the Met or MoMA or, you know, however we play it out, that yeah. that it, at least the information then is accessible in a way that it never was before. And you can't bury, you know, things the way that you could bury things before. If you're a Shepherd Fairy and you steal a photo and you don't cop to it, like, you know, you're going to get called out. Like there is a trail that everyone can see very clearly. And, you know, and I'm all for appropriation, but I'm not for, you know, lying about it. And, you know, like, you know, it probably would have amounted to nothing had he just said, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to not be a total tool about it, you know, pay like a 10 grand fine or fine or something like that, you know, whatever and be done with it. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty funny to think about, you know, because uh and i think about the audience too on the internet like it it's sort of again it's a democratic forest but if someone is inter- if like four people are interested in something like there's a website about it oh totally and that's yeah, yeah. awesome you know yeah. like yeah. even if one person is interested and, and that's great that those things like have have an outlet now yeah you know yeah. and uh and to me that's like sort of the big democratic thing it's like you might have an audience for your work, but it might only be a handful of people, but you yeah. still have that audience, you know? Yeah. And um, the truth is, you know, it's impossible to say the value of that audience. Three people are not the same three people, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that also, that value is uh, relative to who you are and who they are, you know? Um, and, and you're then like level of putting any kind of importance on those three people at all, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting. I like, um, I, I remember thinking about that right after my first kind of like performance. So um, it was this thing in Best Buy where I shot for 24 hours without oh, buying yeah. anything. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and so I remember, um, you know, right after I did that, like suddenly all of these like New York institutions were following me. Like it was just a huge influx of like prestige, right? Yeah. And so um, I shouldn't put that in quotes. I mean, they're prestigious inst- institutions. And but it kind of did a, a number on my head because, you know, I here I was like just doing whatever I felt like I had to do, you know, like I was just sharing this stuff, like, and then suddenly I have all these very different types of people following me that are in the room with me, you know, from MoMA to Joe Schmo artists, like, you know, whatever. And, um, or to like a bot, you know, that doesn't actually exist. And so it was interesting during that time period and literally for a few years to think about how I speak to everyone all at once, (laughs) you know, like, how do I speak to, you know, potentially this particular curator? And then to find out that, like, you know, occasionally I find out, oh, my God, someone's following me. And, like, I had no idea they were following me. And, like, I probably should have been a little bit more, like, conscious about what I say, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And just, like, not even, you know, just to be more con- considerate or conscious or, like, aware. And But then thinking about how that changes, like, well, does it matter if I'm talking to, you know, this fancy curator or to, like, my neighbor, you know? And should yeah. it? Yeah. And, um, and I don't know, like, I really yeah. don't know. And, and then on top of that, like, you know, there's a whole added layer of like, you never really know when they, anyone's listening or not, mm-hmm. um, until you say something really wrong and then they let you know that everyone's yeah, listening. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. The internet is like the great bullshit detector these days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, and it's, out. yeah, it's amazing. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I remember when, uh, I think I'd been following you maybe for like, a couple of months or something like that. I just, just like started to hear about what you were doing when you did the, um, and then you did the, the, the Best Buy shopping thing. And I remember reading that, um, reading stuff about that on like maybe Art Fag City or, or I don't even think Hyperallergic was around at that point. Yeah. They, but, they yeah. were just coming around. They were like a few months old, but yeah. 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 Maybe it was Hyperallergic then because, uh, cause I had, I had been reading that like from the start. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was just such a funny piece to do because, like, there was, there was that like one improv comedy troupe that had gone yeah. into Best Buy and like just pretended to sort of be Best Buy people. Yeah, like, yeah. Wearing, like, I hadn't seen that one at the time, but that improv yeah. everywhere was a huge influence on that whole like part. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was uh, and and that was that was kind of cool to see like something dumb essentially like improv everywhere do it and like actually make it into a smart sort of piece that has some implications yeah. you know because yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that was great because it was, it was like worth it to be specifically best buy and to be yeah. like logging it on twitter and 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 stuff like that um yeah. and that it went for like a whole 24 hours shopping because yeah. yeah. no one no one does that you know people yeah. say they love shopping but they would they would kill anyone to shop for like that long oh god you know? totally and i think the other thing you know that and in in the context of this particular, you know, platform for a learning experience, and you know, when you have a hit, you know, like because yeah. that that performance was a hit, you know, it did well, and you know, it's interesting to see how different people respond to that. Like artists, like you do something that that ends up being successful. How do you how do you evolve? Like, what do you do from there? You know, mm-hmm. and that's been an interesting. And if anything, I can share like, and it's more relevant to like either idea artists, like a performance artist, people that would like, you know, conceptual artists, basically. Yeah. That if you hit on something, what do you do if it does well? Like you just, I didn't yeah. assume that anything was going to happen out of that, you know? Yeah, like yeah. I literally went in with zero expectations other than like, I don't know, fuck, I'm going to go into, you know, Best Buy and tweet some shit. Um, and so when the response was what it was, it kind of was like, whoa, like, okay. But then like, all right, let's do some other stuff that's like sort of similar, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, there's that there's that thing about uh, I'm reading a uh, a book. Um, it's inside the white cube, and it's, it's oh, cool. uh, yeah, a collection of of old essays. And he talks about like that particular gesture thing, and yeah. that that like once you do one type of once you do a gesture, you have to basically put that down because yeah, gotta kill the so gesture. timely, you know. Yeah. And then you you know maybe use like a gesture again, but a different sort of take on it you know and, and it's impossible to know like what's gonna gonna happen with that yeah and i that really is one of those I, like one yeah. of those practical things too about like when you have when you have a hit it's like 
you know, I've like I've had friends like, you know, that'll that'll sort of get some notoriety, but they won't even have like a website, yeah, up or like a way to like sort of maintain those sort of like connections, you know, that you yeah. have with people. Yeah, and I think some of that is like quite honestly physical proximity. So like in New York, I was able to kind of ride this thing, and like you know, I've been conscious about working the media when I can and how I can. And like, that's, those are conscious, like that's work, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but also it's like literally just go to me, it goes back to like trusting. So it's like, all right, like you'll do work that looks a certain way. And like, I really wish I had had that book after I did, you know, best on by would have been really beneficial to say like, okay, what does it look like if I completely put this down? But on the flip side, and it, it like really forced me to keep like looking at these things from different angles for a period of a couple of years that ended up leading to some really cool you know opportunities basically yeah, yeah. Um, and I think now I'm in this position of you know I'm not trying to recreate the same gesture, but I'm also like and I hit these moments where it's like I know I'm close like I just did something that like that touched a nerve and and yeah. honestly, the occupy man thing was sort of like was was sort of similar and and that I knew that I had to do it. I just like it happened. And the next thing I know, it ended up leading to, um, to uh, an opportunity to speak at a TED Talk um, in, in New York, which was like awesome. And like, yeah. you know, so that's like something totally that happened, yeah. which was like pretty awesome. But yeah. then also really funny because TED doesn't pay their speakers. So I ended up talking about that a little bit in my talk because it was like, you know, yeah. here I am talking I about would, money. You know, I would think that like the TED stuff would be, you know, like, Five, like four, ten, four thousand, ten thousand dollar, depending on like. Yeah, who but does I mean, it, you know? yeah, this was like a um, well. Apparently, across the whole thing, they don't pay any of their even at the main event. But this was like an offshoot event. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really interesting to learn that and then to share it, and you know, and so, you know, that kind of awareness was really. It was very interesting to participate in that particular conference, and yeah. you know, I know I knew one of the organizers that put it on. He's a great guy. Like I have nothing. But nice things to say about that, you know, particular person. But the sort of institution of idea generation as yeah. a business, you know, and as T E D like inspiration, is, you know. <laughs> yeah, I met the guy that does quality. You know? I met the guy yeah. that does quality control for them in San Francisco wow. yeah. through yeah. through uh, this uh, this um, swing dancer that I went to go uh, and and hang out with, and uh, and that was her roommate. And and I was just like, interesting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's it's weird to see that from like a different angle. Like the guy that just goes and makes sure the video is like recorded correctly and is yeah. gonna play right, and that it sort of relatively makes sense and is gonna function. Yeah. Um, but and then I started thinking about what his job must be like. It must be like you know an overdose of inspiration all the time oh my god you know how like you could read you could read like productivity like tips you know until you've procrastinated totally if you you have his information send it to me because i'd love to see what he thinks of my video because what i ended up doing was i blindfolded the audience and i didn't plan my talk (laughs) So, (laughs) so, so i literally went up there like all right i gave everyone an envelope and I told them to, you know, once they all had an envelope, I was like, all right, take it out. And then I was like, if you put your blindfolds on now, we can start. And so I like blindfolded everyone and had no presentation and just yeah. literally like talked about the process of like coming up with ideas. And, and so anyway, so I was really kind of like sticking it to the, you know, yeah. like just being like, look, you guys, like, let's, yeah. what is it? But mean that's, to have but that's a really cool, cool idea in terms, in terms of too, like them all being able to go back and look at it. You know, like, then it ends up feeding right back in. It's like, yeah, wait yeah. a second, I'm I'm the sucker. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. But in any event, so yeah, that's hilarious. So yeah, but uh, cool. Any any questions? Like, actually, I need to get. Yeah, I was thinking that that we pretty much covered basically like everything <laughs> and more. <laughs> it's been, it's yeah. Been covered. Yeah. No, but this well, was this was really fun, and uh, yeah, we'll same. have to we'll have to check back sometime. We'll, I'll let you know like next time I'm headed up to New York and stuff. Yeah, and, please. Yeah, and, do uh, that. and everything. But cool. uh, yeah, uh, I guess like the last thing is like, what what are you thinking? What are you thinking next? Like, what's the next project? Um, I think you know I did a rent piece recently, which was uh, a sale to to come up with money for rent. So I'm thinking about doing. 
That's very um, 1920s for sure. <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking about doing a, a bill piece. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so I've got a few proposals out to people um, for projects um, that are in various stages of development. Um, I, I've been my my practice right now is very sort of like fragmented and splintered. I've been doing smaller things kind of here and there. One bigger project that I did recently, which I think is kind of where things are going with with my work, is more in the installation realm. So I did this piece in uh, Indianapolis uh, Museum of Contemporary Art um, in a show that was curated by Ben Valentine called You Can Count on Me. Mm -hmm. And basically it was a light bulb that was connected to this device so that any time someone tweeted the phrase, you can count on me, the light bulb turned either on or off. Um, and No, it turned on and then it turned off. And then it was sort of installed next to um, a, a, a printout of a clicker, like a tally counter yeah. that you would like um, count heads and then an actual uh, tally counter and so um, this idea is sort of being related to the the Kosuth, uh chair 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 you know picture of a chair definition yeah. of chair, actual chair um, but doing that sort of for the social media virtual digital age where this light bulb represents people talking about it there's an actual clicker and then there's an image of a clicker um, and so I have, I've had some other ideas in, in that same kind of realm of installation where it's things are happening in real time but it's a physical representation of it and it's kind of that came out of this project I did where for two weeks um, the internet uh, controlled the bedroom light um, in my bedroom so yeah. anytime I got mentioned <laughs> on Twitter my light turned on and um, it was really crazy to do that for two weeks and I didn't tell anyone I was doing it yeah um, so the sort of projects like that that are kind of taking these things that are happening online and converting them into like real world experiences that affect me somehow, but also affect like kind of this our experience of it. Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. It's a really yeah. long winded answer. I haven't quite gotten no, to, like no, no. points. <laughs> no, I mean the, the whatever, but but no, that that sounds great. I mean, yeah. that sort of like that sort of installation temporal real time thing you know it's you know along with the whole social social thing and sort of like uh collectively not even conscious you know yeah 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 thing. and that that's people pretty... participating without even realizing that they're participating in yeah. this thing that's happening but has a real world effect like it, just yeah, really yeah. briefly i thought about doing one where Something happens, I haven't figured it out, but basically it shocks me, you know? So it's like a physical yeah, yeah. shock that happens on my body when something happens online, you know, that people are unaware of. So there's something, and it's still like, like we were talking about earlier, it's like, I know I'm close, I'm like not quite there, I'm like, it's in there and I just gotta like pull it out. And I, yeah. and so, so anyway, so we'll see you kind of where it goes, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's, so. that's pretty fascinating. I'm, I'm excited to see like how that, how that ends up. Thanks, man. Yeah. 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 I appreciate cool. it. Awesome. Right, well, well, yeah, it's been such a yeah. pleasure chatting with you. And, yeah. and you kids keep learning out <laughs> there in learn land. <laughs> yeah. Sounds awesome. good. Thanks Tip for that. thanks for your time. I'll let you go. Oh dude, my pleasure, man. Cheers. Yeah. Take care. You too.